Please welcome now Lily Eskelson Garcia for the introduction of our honoree. Buenas tardes. And my commercial, first of all, you'll find at the back table, if there is a back table, um, we're working with United We Dream on a back to school guide for educators. Um, NEA and United We Dream have put this together. You'll want to take a handful and pass them around. Um, end of commercial. They gave me, um, they gave me the official bio of our new Secretary of Labor. Bios are boring. I just have to tell you, I, I, I used to think bios were boring, um, but I needed to do some research to properly um, introduce our honoree this afternoon. And when you read his incredible life story, his immigrant family from the Dominican Republic, his accomplishments, um, you just wonder who's gonna play him in the made-for-TV movie. Uh, and, and I'm thinking like, John Leguizamo, maybe? Um, I'm a teacher, and so I love in his bio that Secretary Perez was an excellent student. I love that he has a Harvard degree, but not as much um, uh, as I love the rest of the story. As someone who put myself through college with Pell Grants and scholarships and uh, working as a starving folk singer, I love that you put yourself through college uh, with Pell Grants and scholarships and as a starving trash collector, among other things. You know, we never believed it when our parents told us, you know, hard work builds character. It builds character to get your hands dirty. Um, it does, and he's proof. Character is a word that I kept hearing from people who know the secretary personally. One friend said he is a man of conscience and character. And another friend said, yeah, Tom's a real character. <laughs> it's all in the tone when you say it, um, but consistently I did hear the word character. And I would add a word of my own, guerrero. This man is a warrior, es un guerrero. Para la justicia. He has been a warrior for justice. He has fought against worker exploitation, racial profiling, hate crimes. He has fought for workplace safety and a living wage and job training for veterans and funding for community colleges and help for middle class families who were on the verge of home foreclosures. And he has fought for compassionate, comprehensive, please God, immigration reform. And I'm not just waiting for the movie. For Christmas, I'm gonna order my Tom Perez Warrior for Justice action figure doll. Um, because he is an actual action figure. Um, if you've ever seen the Secret Service folks trying to keep up with him while he's jogging or riding his bike uh, to work, he's not afraid of getting dirty. He's not afraid of getting sweaty. Uh, a labor secretary really should not be afraid of hard work. And he's not afraid of anything. He is a man who moves mountains. And nobody can keep up with him because he is a man on a mission. He has his eyes on a very special prize that moves him. His purpose in life is in front of him every single day. He will do whatever it takes to make the world a more worthy place for three particular human beings, three people with actual names, Susana, Amalia, Raphael. He has a vision of the world he wants for his own three children. And most people in the world stop right there. They're going, yep, I'm really going to work hard for my kids. The difference is, Tom Perez says, the world I want for my own children is the world I want for everyone's child. So read his bio. It's very impressive, but know in your heart what is not written on that resume. 
It has been his life's work to be a warrior, to fight for a world that is worthy of all our children, para todos los niños. Y por eso, qué honor para mí, prestarles un hombre, un guerrero de veras. It is my honor to present to you a man who is a true warrior for the middle class, for the worker, for the family, for the future of all our children. The Secretary of Labor, the warrior, the Honorable Thomas Perez. Thank you. Lily, thank you for that uh, all too kind introduction. Uh, your colleague and uh, my good friend Joel had suggested maybe Bob Denver or Larry Storch. So I appreciate that you uh, traded up on that. And uh, I really want to thank you for all you've done on behalf of kids and, uh, and your colleague Dennis and all of the uh, hundreds of thousands of folks that you help. My kids are proud public school students in Montgomery County and uh, NEA affiliate, and you know that. So uh, it, it is really an honor to be here with all of you today. And it's a particular honor uh, to be here with Dolores Huerta. I mean, you know, I'm a student of the civil rights movement. When you sit next to, you know, la generalissima, la jefe, uh, you know, the folks who wrote this history uh, that is, uh, they, you know, I have these days when you drive home and you say, they're paying me to do this job. I can't believe it. Uh, today's one of those days because I got the honor of having my photo taken with Dolores Huerta. So thank you for everything that you do for everyone. You know, and thank you to all of you. There's so many people in this room have helped me throughout so many different phases of my life uh, in the most recently with the Department of Labor, uh, before that, uh, the Department of Justice, before that, uh, state and local government. Uh, there's no better leader uh, than my good friend, Rashern Baker in Prince George's County. Uh, he, has, he understands what coalitions are about. He understands leadership. And uh, so many other people in this room who've played such a big role in helping. And so I really appreciate that. I have so many friends in the a business community who've been so helpful because uh, we can't be dividing us up. We can't ha get into our ideological echo chambers. Uh, that doesn't help anybody. And uh, the work that my friends in the business community have done, I'm so grateful for. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't introduce my wife, Anne Marie, because you know we just celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. And one of the one of the many reasons I feel lucky is that. Uh, Three times in a row, our kids, they look like their mother. That's the best gift that they could have. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And I'm very grateful, really, for the example that she sets. Uh, she's a lawyer who works here at the DC Legal Clinic for the Homeless, doing so much work on behalf of uh, our most vulnerable. And uh, she models behavior for our children in ways that we hope will have a return on investment. And then we think they are having that return on investment. And so I'm so grateful for her. And let me talk about my friend, Mickey Ibarra, for a moment. Because, uh, you know, there's some people that you say, you know, if you don't like Mickey or you don't like so-and-so, it's your fault. Well, Mickey's one of those people. If you don't like Mickey Ibarra, it's your fault. I'm just telling you right now. And uh, that's the reality. Because I've known him for years. And Mickey has taught me so much uh, about friendship, about leadership, about how you get things done. And uh, perhaps more importantly than anything, you've taught me that, uh, you know, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. And that is the Mickey Ibarra that I've always known. And so I really want to say thank you. And, you know, the other day, you know, the other day, uh, Mickey and I had a chance to spend some one-on-one -on -one time together. And we were reminiscing about uh, a story because, you know, my mother always taught me. My mother... My late mother was uh, a real uh, role model for me, and uh, she taught me 
uh, years ago when I was a kid. You know, she always said, Tom, everything happens for a reason. She was a person of deep faith. Went to church every single day until her health started failing her. And she always used to say, everything happened for a reason. Well, Mickey and I were reminiscing about the year 2006. I was on the Montgomery County Council, and uh, I loved that job because we were able to help people. We were in the front lines, just like Rashern is, just like uh, people like Victor Ramirez, Adam Ortiz, and so many others were, just like the mayor of Central Falls is. And we were on the front lines. I was running for attorney general. We had just got some polling back. We were, uh, it was a dead heat. It was a three-person race. We were surging in the right direction. We were just about to get on TV because there were people like Mickey Ibarra and Ken Trujillo and others who had invested in our campaign. We're 10 days out of the campaign and my phone rings and uh, it's someone telling me that uh, the state court of appeals, the highest court in Maryland, just kicked me out of the race on a technicality. So uh, I was going 70 miles an hour and I hit a brick wall that I had never seen or never anticipated. And uh, I remember that day well. It was a Friday afternoon. Uh, it was not one of my better days. And Mickey and I were reminiscing on it. And I remember thinking uh, at this point, my mother had died uh, roughly 10 months earlier. And I remember thinking, okay, I remember what she said. You know, everything happens for a reason. The reason wasn't jumping out at me at the moment. <laughs> you know, it wasn't readily apparent. You know, she used to say, a door closes, windows open. And you know what? I thought I was in solitary confinement. I saw darkness. I saw nothing but darkness at that moment. And for, frankly, weeks after, because I couldn't quite figure out what happened. And you know what happened then? Fast forward to a couple, few months later, Governor O'Malley uh, appoints me uh, as Secretary of Labor, and we have an opportunity to go across the state, building partnerships with businesses and others, helping people uh, who needed the skills to compete making sure that workplaces were safe, working with our local colleagues and local government and elsewhere uh, to address the foreclosure crisis, which had hit so many communities, disproportionately Prince George's and elsewhere. And we were able to do so much. And then a couple years later, the president uh, nominates me to serve as the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, which was, you know, for anybody who's been a civil rights lawyer, that's the dream job. And I remember June of that year, Senator Kennedy calling me. He only had a couple months left to live, and I worked for him. And anyone, you know, when you work for Senator Kennedy, you're part of the Kennedy family for life. And I remember him calling me to say, this is a really important job, and I am so, I am so excited for you. And I had that privilege of going around the country, expanding opportunity uh, for everyone, and working together to make sure that the corrosive power of fine print didn't result in the American dream becoming the American nightmare for homeowners and working with uh, so many other people on police reform, on education reform, so many critical issues. And then uh, earlier this year, I was literally on a ready, getting ready to go to uh, Malaysia on a trip uh, to talk about human rights in Malaysia and talk about how Muslim, Christian, and other populations can coexist. And I'm sitting in the airport, at National Airport, and the phone rings, and it was the White House. We'd like to talk to you about the Department of Labor job. And after I picked myself off the chair, I said, well, I'm actually heading to Malaysia. And I ended up interviewing with the president, and I moved my trip around a little bit, came back a day early, took a 36-hour flight, got back one night, interviewed with the president the Friday before the inauguration. And with your help, I was able to get confirmed roughly three months ago, July the 21st of this year. And so I have to say thank you. I have to say thank you not only to all of you and not only to the president for your support and for his support and confidence, but I have to say thank you to those folks back in Maryland in 2006, those folks who thought they could kick me and get me down and get me out of a race. And I want to tell you, my mother was right. Everything does happen for a reason. You know, I really do feel, uh, as I st stand here before you, that uh, we are a product of the American dream, you know? And, and like so many of you in this room, you know, my story, your story, uh, it's the story of the immigrants coming to America, the story of people looking 
uh, for a better life, looking to help. My folks uh, were born in the Dominican Republic. My maternal grandfather was uh, the ambassador to the U.S. from the Dominican Republic uh, until he spoke out after the massacre of the Haitians in the 30s. It was a brutal massacre. Roughly 20,000 people senselessly murdered. And after he spoke out, he was declared non grata. My father uh, was part of the student movement there. He had to get out of Dodge. And they settled, they got married, and they came to America. And my father uh, went into the U.S. Army as a legal immigrant. And as you well know, legal immigrants have been serving this nation with distinction since the Revolutionary War. And as you, and as you may recall, legal immigrants and the first fatality in the most recent war in Iraq was a legal immigrant from Guatemala who came here, was undocumented, had his status adjusted, enlisted in the U.S. Army, made the ultimate sacrifice, and received his citizenship posthumously. My uncle, were he alive, my near dear uncle Hugh, uh, he was proud of showing you his war wounds that he sustained in World War II fighting on behalf of the United States of America. My family and my extended family, they were proud to serve this nation. They were proud of their Dominican roots, and they were proud of their American roots. And they were proud to be here. And they were proud to serve. And so was my dad. And after he got out of the service, my folks settled in Buffalo, New York. And they did that for one obvious reason. They wanted weather that was similar to DR. <laughs> and they found it. And you know, um, they always taught me something else, too, because I sat through a lot of dinner table conversation about politics, because when you've been kicked out of a country and disrupted in the way that they had, and you saw bad things happen in the way they had, you know, it has a profound effect on your life. And that was the currency of our dinner table conversation, was politics and what's happening back home. My folks never went out to dinner. They never went on vacation. Why would you go rent a house for a week? when you own a house. That would be two houses, one too many. That was my parents' logic. I kid you not. We went on one vacation in uh, the 12 years that I was alive and my dad was alive. One vacation, because it was unnecessary. And that was their world. They wanted to make sure that my four siblings and I, I was the caboose, you know, four and four and a half years and then me. You know, when you're Catholic, you don't call it a mistake. You call it God's gift. <laughs> you know that. And they settled in Buffalo. And we had a wonderful time in Buffalo. And one other thing they taught us was, you know, adversity builds character. And the year 1974 was kind of a character building year, I guess you'll call it. Not just for Richard Nixon, but for Tom Perez. And it was a character building year because frankly, if on January 1st you had said to our family, one of your parents is going to die, there would have been unanimity that it would have been my mother, not my father, because she had chronic health issues. She, you know, basically had a frequent flyer card to the hospital because she had a number of issues. And she went to New York early 74 for major surgery because there was no surgeon in Buffalo uh, with the competency to do it. So she went to uh, Columbia Presbyterian in New York, which gave her an opportunity to get back to Mecca, which for any Dominican in this room you know is Washington Heights, 152nd and Riverside Drive, the Riviera, okay? Sen Senator, you know that inner area of the country, okay? That's an amen moment in the Dominican room. And uh, so she had that surgery. She came back, uh, got home. You know, things were getting better, getting back to normal. Uh, my aunt, who was from Columbia, was living in Columbia with her husband, you know, she had been staying with us for a few months because we needed some help. And she got ready to leave. Uh, she was going to leave the Monday after Easter Sunday. And uh, Easter Sunday was the first heart attack that my dad had. Now, I was the youngest, and they thought, we need to make sure that Tom uh, is sheltered from that. A, a very laudable aim, but a learning moment for me. Tell your kids the truth. And so I thought everything was hunky-dory and things were well and we were moving right along. And then a few months later is when my dad had his fatal heart attack, which was uh, the end of June of 74. And so things were kind of tough. And we had the service in uh, DR. My parents' dream was to raise their kids here, return home, and didn't quite work out for either of them. But 
uh, they did raise their kids here and they did a pretty good job because my siblings are all doctors. I didn't become a doctor because I watched my brother operate one day and after they peeled me off the ground, uh, I think I've decided I need a new line of work. That is a true story. And after uh, we got back from DR for the service, um, my mom, as I said before, uh, she checked back into the hospital because a lot of her chronic issues flared up. And so, you know, it was a, I hated the end of summer. What did you do on your summer vacation? That was not a good lesson that fall because it wasn't a very, very good summer. But I'm happy to report that she did well and she recovered and she was there for us. And we had this rock of a community in Buffalo. You know, my website at home, when I turn my computer on, still has the Buffalo news. People wonder why. Well, because I'm a masochist. I like teams that lose World Series and football games. I was a Red Sox fan. I was a Bills fan. Now the Red Sox win once in a while. But you know what? Buffalo was our community. People had our back. My siblings had our back. And with the benefit of Pell Grants, and I used to call them Perez Grants, because I had older siblings who would help me out. So we had the Pell Grants and the Perez Grants. And with that, I was able to get through college and law school. And by the way, my first client in law school was Tom Perez, because uh, the Social Security Administration came after me saying that I had worked too many hours in college. This is a true story. And you know, there's an adage, I represented myself, there's an adage that says, you know, show me a lawyer who represents himself and I'll show you a man with a fool as a client. Well, this fool won that case, okay? And we moved on. And you know, I wish all that stuff hadn't happened, you know? We can stipulate to that. But what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and it informs what you do for a living. And that's why I do what I do, because that's what we learn. It's not unique necessarily to the immigrant experience, but it has been a powerful part of who I am and what I do. Remembering that the most important lesson my folks taught all of us is the following. And it's not a lesson unique to my folks, but it was really a biblical lesson. To whom much is given, much is expected. And so I used to teach law school and I used to challenge my students, you know what? I want you guys to make sure you go out there and you can say that you've loved every job you've ever had because lawyers are the most risk averse group of folks I've ever met. You know, they get into these jobs that are sometimes, you know, you know monetarily rewarding but not necessarily spiritually as rewarding. And so I used to challenge my students. The last assignment I would give them in the semester, the second last assignment, is I would ask them to write their own obituary. And the reason I asked them to do that was because I wanted them to reflect on what they want their legacy to be. You know, after they're gone, what are people gonna write about you? Don't start thinking about that the day before you die. You know, it's a little bit late. <laughs> Think about that while you're in school. Think about that then. And you know, I'm very, I'm very blessed because I feel like I was able to answer that question with the help of my family and with the help of my community. And the answer to that was, I was put on the planet to make sure we expand opportunity for people. Because when I was in local government, that's what we tried to do. And I'm so proud of the fact that the county that I had the privilege of representing has a proud history of welcoming people, of inclusion, of making sure that the American dream is a dream that's accessible to everybody. And when we were in the state of Maryland, we did the same thing, building partnerships, expanding opportunity. And in my federal service, I have been so blessed to have the ability to go out there in communities across this country to address some of the most biggest challenges that we confront. And one of the things that I recall so vividly in my first 90 days on the job was getting to go to the 50th anniversary 
of the March on Washington because that really brought together my two lives, civil rights and labor rights. And I remember sitting there listening to the president, listening to other people talk, thinking about and reflecting on the tremendous progress that we have made. And make no mistake about it, we've made so much progress. And as the president correctly pointed out, it does a disservice to those people who died in the process to suggest that we have made no progress. It really does a disservice. But at the same time, it would do an equal disservice if we didn't acknowledge, in the words of Senator Kennedy, the unfinished business of America. It's the unfinished business of civil rights. The unfinished business of making sure that everybody has access to economic justice and economic opportunity that everybody has the same opportunities to build those ladders of success that my parents gave my siblings and I by focusing on education, by making sure in our family there was no such thing as a vacation because you know what? We're investing that money so that our kids can get to college and do what they want to do. That's what we learned and that's what I learned and that's what I have tried to devote my life to. And I'm so impressed by the people that have been part of that journey. Life is the journey, it's not the destination. And it's been a wonderful journey throughout. And we've done so much. I'm so proud of the work I've done in every phase of that journey. But I also reflect with great regularity on that unfinished business. I can't help but reflect as I left the Civil Rights Division on the number one piece of unfinished business, and that is addressing issues of voting rights. I was with John Lewis quite literally a couple days ago. And every time I see him, and I have a signed uh, photograph of him and me in my office, one of my true heroes. And he talks about the Edmund Pettus Bridge. He talks about that fateful day when he almost lost his life. And he talks about what they did to get the voting rights bill passed shortly thereafter. And we're about to celebrate uh, the 48th anniversary of that bill this year, two years away from 50. And it is so challenging to see what's happening because we're having a pitch battle about the direction of our country and that's the essence of democracy. But I always thought that what we should do in that context is have that battle and then do our level best to make sure that every single person who's eligible to vote gets to the bowl and it exercises the franchise and that we don't single out and target our perceived ideological foes and make it harder for them to vote. And I'm so impressed with people like Colin Powell and others who've spoken out on this because this isn't a Republican or a Democratic issue. One of the biggest leaders in the Voting Rights Act in Congress is Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner, Republican of Wisconsin, and I applaud his continuing efforts. So this isn't about R's and D's. This is about everybody. And this is about our leadership in the global world, setting the example of what democracy should be doing. And so I still find myself reflecting on those issues. I still find myself talking to Eric Holder a lot because these things are important. And I find myself reflecting and executing every day the business of the Department of Labor, which is the Department of Opportunity. And I have a portrait right behind my desk if you come for a visit of Francis Perkins, who I think is the gold standard of labor secretaries, just like John Doerr, for those of you who remember civil rights history, was the gold standard for civil rights heads of the Justice Department. She, so many things that we take for granted today were brought to us by Frances Perkins. And I believe today that the work of the Labor Department has never been more important since she was there because there are so many people in need. We're making so much progress in our recovery. You know, we've had 43 consecutive months of private sector job growth to the tune of 7.6 million jobs. Our unemployment rate is going steadily down, but not fast enough. And if the president were here, he'd be the first to tell you that we've got to have our foot on the accelerator. We need to do more. We need to address, in addition, the growing inequality gap, a gap that was discussed in the March on Washington, which you know was a march for jobs as well as a march for civil rights. That's what we need to be talking about and that's what we're doing in the Department of Labor. Expanding access to opportunity, 
by using our regulatory authority, by using our bully pulpit, by using our enforcement authority, by using our partnerships with businesses, labor unions, other key stakeholders to make sure that we do things. And let me give you an example or two of things that I am very proud of that help people. There are 1.8 million home health workers in America, 90% of whom are women, 50% of whom are minority, 40% of whom are on some form of public assistance. They're working hard and falling behind, and they do God's work without a doubt. And what do we see in our wage and hour laws? What we saw was a loophole in which home health workers were treated like babysitters. My girls babysit. They do a great job. But you know what? They don't hold a candle to home health workers. And as a result, they weren't entitled to the protections of minimum wage and overtime laws. And so we changed that. And by the way, we have a shortage of home health care workers. Why? Because I met one who said, I left that industry and I'm now working in fast food because that is a better career track for me. I can make more money. And I mean no disrespect to the fast food or any other service industry. But that's not right. We've got to change that paradigm. And that's why we enacted that regulation so we can help two million people and the next generation of home health workers. And just to be selfish for a moment, people like me who are going to need them very soon, sooner than I can admit. And so many people who need them now. And so that's how we expand opportunity. We expand opportunity by working to raise the minimum wage. And by in so doing by debunking false choices, by noting that it is an absolute false choice that we either have profits for our shareholders or fair wages for our workers. Just take the example of Costco. I've spent time with Jim Senegal, the former CEO, who spent 20, 30 years in Costco. My Costco card's so old, I have hair on my head from that photo that I took. <laughs> you know, Jim has written the book on how you can return investment for your shareholders and have a living wage for your workers. And in addition, how you can make sure that you leverage your position as a major retailer in America to affect the supply chain for people like Dolores Huerta and the people that she represented so that the strawberries that you buy at Costco were picked by workers who are earning a decent wage. And I've spoken to their supply chain management. They're doing it, and they're doing it well. And so we need to debunk these false choices. You either have job growth or you have job safety. That's a false choice. And I know that because employers tell me, employers who play by the rules tell me that my most important asset is my worker. And if I compromise and cut corners on safety, I hurt my workers, I hurt my bottom line, and I, I lead that race to the bottom. And so we need to reject those false choices. And we do so in the work that we do in partnership with industry, workers, all key stakeholders. We need to expand opportunity by making sure that we work together to pass immigration reform and pass it soon. We expand opportunity by bringing together employers, workers, community colleges around the issue that's one of the biggest sleeper issues I see, and that's the issue of the skills gap. I cannot tell you the number of employers who tell me, I want to expand my workforce, but 80% of the people coming in don't have the skills to succeed. And there are employers in this room that have made major investments in their workforce. Sodexo, by way of example who've invested in that workforce. And there are partnerships out there along those lines that make sure that we're investing in skills. There's so much we can do. And we work with our state and local partners. We work with our corporate partners. We work with unions. And if you go to Las Vegas, you see the large employers and the unions working together to make sure that the service industry employees have a pathway to upward mobility and earn a decent wage and get health care benefits. That's the world you see. Don't believe the models that say you only, the only way to survive 
is on subminimum wage or minimum wage paradigms. That's incorrect, categorically incorrect. And so that's the thing we do at the Department of Labor is expanding opportunity in those ways, making sure that people have access to the opportunity to get health care. And we work with our partners at HHS and elsewhere to implement the Affordable Care Act. Yes, we've had challenges. Yes, the president has talked about it. And yes, we will fix those challenges. Because you know what? The Affordable Care Act is not only a legal and a health care imperative, it's a moral imperative. I saw a guy who's a head of a major cancer institute who said, you know what, if you have cancer, one of the biggest determiners of whether you're going to live more than five years is whether you have health insurance. That's a fact. And that's why we're working so hard. And that's why we've already seen benefits. The Affordable Care Act is much more than a website. Ask the three million people under 26 who already have health insurance. Ask the people who now have access to preventive care, mammograms, other forms of care. And we need to work together. And I'm so appreciative of all the business leaders with whom I have met who get this and who are working so hard. You know, many of them say, and I totally get it, you know, what's going on in Washington? Why can't you get things done in Washington? And I often hearken back to my family. You know, I'm one of five. We're an ecumenical family. Three Democrats, two Republicans. You know, my mother, you know, she grew up in Washington Heights. She was one of nine. They were evenly divided between Dodger fans, Giants fans, and Yankee fans. So, you know, they had tough conversations at the table. But you know what? In my family, it didn't matter if you were voting a Republican or a Democrat. We had values that transcended that. We had the values of we're all in this together. We're all community. We all, in times of greatest challenge, you don't turn at each other or on each other. You work toward each other, working together. That's not simply an experience unique to my family. I've seen that in Buffalo. I've seen that across America. And that's the spirit that we need to invoke because immigration reform has always been bipartisan. Ronald Reagan, Alan Simpson, Ted Kennedy and others. So many of these other issues, the minimum wage has been bipartisan. So many of these challenges that we confront as a nation have been bipartisan. The infrastructure that we discuss. Who brought us the interstate highway system? It was Dwight Eisenhower. And so as we move forward, I really take heart. I take comfort. I'm, I am an eternal optimist. Because you know what? Adversity does build character. And you know what? I come from the grassroots. And I know that if the nation continues to advocate, as you have, on immigration, on all of these other issues, we will succeed. We will have our si se puede moments. And we will make sure that we build a better America. We will reject false choices. We will come together but we will need your help. This is not a time to sit on the sidelines. This is a time to engage. This is a time to make your voice heard. This is a time to make sure we continue to build coalitions in the spirit of Dolores Huerta and so many others who wrote the book on it. This is the time to make sure that the better bargain for the middle class is a bargain that we can all be proud of. Thank you so much for this honor. And thank you, Mickey, for your leadership.